Today we're going to talk about maps, maps in general, types of maps, projections, uh, other issues that come up with uh, cartographic representations. This is a map. This is a map of the peninsula uh, of Yucatan in Mexico. It was done for my PhD dissertation. The dots are archaeological sites that were recorded with a GPS data collector back in the 60s and 70s when uh, GPS data collectors were so large you had to haul them around in the trunk of a car or the bed of a pickup truck. The lines represent lines of annual rainfall and you can see that they shade from a darker green color to a light sand colored and if you uh, interpret those you'll see that the northwest portion of the Yucatan Peninsula is basically a tropical desert. So that's a map of sorts. It has uh, all the requirements for being a map and that is a scale bar symbology and a reference system. All maps distort representations of the surface of the Earth. The reason they do is because they're flat. So they're 2D representations of a 3D object. So the best representation of a map is a globe for showing the Earth's surface. Even globes distort the surface of the Earth because they don't show the topography, which is the lay of the land, if the scales for vertical exaggeration, the vertical scale, and the horizontal scale, scale is the relationship between units on a map and units in the real world, were the same, a globe would be as smooth as a bowling ball. You've seen these globes that have little bumps that represent mountain ranges. That's vertical exaggeration. So in any event, a map can preserve some, but all, not all of the following characteristics. The true angle between points on the map, they are generally referred about as azimuthal maps. True distance between two points on the surface of the earth or any points on the surface of the earth. They're generally referred about as equidistant, true area. So the true area of features like a state or the boundary of a city, they're generally called equivalents or equivalent maps and true shape, the true shape of an object like a county or a city boundary, they're generally referred about as conformal. So once again, a map distorts some of these characteristics and generally is selected because it preserves one of but not all of the uh, angle, distance, area, or shape. How do we project a 3D surface onto a 2D surface? Well, I use the orthographic representation up here in the upper left and if you can imagine the globe is a clear plastic uh, ellipse or circle that has printed in black the graticule and all the entities, map entities that you want to represent could be points for cities, boundaries for counties, whatever printed on that map. Inside that clear globe is a light. Outside you place either in contact uh, at one place or multiple places some sort of medium that's photosensitive and what happens is the light shines from the center out, uh, creates shadows for the graticule if you will, and those shadows are imprinted on whatever medium wrap that particular 3D object. As you can imagine, from the point of contact, 
to places where there's a lot of distance between the surface of the 3D object and the photosensitive medium, there's a lot of distortion. So that creates the distortion, if you will. There are certain projection families. As mutual projection families are generally what we call planar. Conic projections uh, or another form of projection usually used in northern latitudes and cylindrical projections where you wrap a imaginary cylinder of photosensitive medium around the globe and project onto that. Two of them are developable sorts of projections in the sense that you have to, after all of the imprints of what's on the planet or globe are on the medium, you have to cut it in some way. And this is not literally cut it. Back in the day, we might have done that, but in a mathematical way, cut it, open it up, and uh, it gives a best representation of that 3D object. That's conic and cylindrical are developable. As mutual is non-developable, when you pull it away from the surface, you don't have to do anything with the medium. These are different sorts of cylindrical projections. They are different in terms of how they contact the surface of the planet and also their orientation. Cylindrical projections can be either um, tangent, meaning they contact the surface of the 3D object in one area, or secant, they contact the surface of the planet in two areas. So the secant projection has less distortion than the tangent projection. You can also do a regular cylindrical projection which is vertical up and down with its point of tangency on the equator, that's actually a Mercator projection. And you can do transverse cylindrical projection. Universal transverse cylindrical is the projection that refers about. Its point of tangency is on the meridians, the lines that define north and south. Um, th they actually run north and south and they define uh, latitude, which is east, uh, I'm sorry, longitude, which is east and west. And then you have oblique, which is not used that often. Conical projections um, slip down over the planet. They're generally used in northern latitudes because they preserve direction very well, and they can be tangent or secant as well. Planar or azimuthal, flat piece of medium, up against the planet can either be tangent, having one point of contact, or secant, uh, having two points of contact. And they're azimuthal, so once again, they preserve distance or direction. This is a comparison of projections and how it impacts the look of the United States on a map. And if you see that northern parallel curvature that indicates it's preserving area. Lambert conformal conic is a good projection for preserving shape. Mercator distorts but it preserves east-west direction very well. Universal transverse Mercator works on a couple of those variables. This is just a flat illustration of three different map projections centered at 39 north and 96 west. You can see Lambert conformal conic is preserving the shape of those particular features as well as area. Mercator is preserving the east-west direction of them. And unprojected latitude and longitude uh, is just a flat grid that is not preserving much of anything. We have what we are known as coordinate systems. We work with two major coordinate systems, polar coordinate systems, 
uh, allow distances from point of origin uh, to point of origin and an angle to define those positions. Those are called latitude and longitude. You've heard those before. Cartesian coordinate systems are just like Cartesian coordinate systems that you uh, studied in geometry, if you will. They have an x-axis and a y-axis. X for easting in coordinate systems and Y for northing in those coordinate systems. That's the UTM, and we'll talk about that later as well. Graticule is uh, a development of the Greeks. The Greeks designed the Graticule so they could know their position in relationship to other positions on the planet's surface and plot them, if you will, on maps. So the graticule consists of parallels which run east and west and define north and south latitude, north and south degrees, and meridians which run north and south and define longitude, east-west degrees. As you can see from the illustration in the lower right, you cannot exceed 90 degrees of latitude. Because if you go north, when you hit the pole, you're at 90 degrees. If you go over the pole, you're descending in degrees of latitude. As you go south, same thing. You go to the south pole, it's 90 degrees south. Once you move over that on the opposite side of the earth, you're declining in degrees of latitude. The equator is zero degrees of latitude. The prime meridian, which is outside of Greenwich, England, it's in Greenwich, England, just outside of London, is zero degrees of longitude. Most of the folks on the planet have agreed on that. There are other prime meridians, though. This shows how meridians, here's the prime meridian, shows how they converge at the poles. But parallels, lines of latitude that demarcate latitude, run east and west, do not converge. Well, what does that tell you? It tells you, number one, that a degree of latitude, north-south direction, regardless of where you are on the planet, is the same distance, same distance. But a degree of longitude east-west is at its maximum at the equator and declines as you move north and south until you get all the way to the poles where it is zero, zero at the poles. There are 360 degrees, 60 minutes in one degree, and 60 seconds in one minute. That's how we define latitude and longitude. Degrees, minutes, and seconds. One degree at the equator of longitude is 111 kilometers or 69 miles of surface area. By the time you get to Washington, D.C., one degree of latitude is 88.8 .8 kilometers or 55.2 miles. That's because the meridians converge at the pole. Well, how do we figure latitude and longitude? Well, let's start with longitude. Imagine an axis running from pole to pole and two lines, two lines, that are swiveled on that axis. One goes extends to the prime meridian. The other one extends to whatever point you want to understand the longitude is. So wherever you move on that, this angle between the one extension to the prime meridian and the one extension out to the surface, wherever that map object is you want to measure longitude to, that angle is longitude. 
generally, if we move east of the prime meridian, it's a positive. If we move west, it's a negative until it gets to 180 degrees, which is the opposite side of the prime meridian. And that's the uh, international time zone change. So that's where the 24 hour time changes, where the day changes. Okay, imagine for latitude, you have a fixed extension at the equator, runs out to the equator, and then you have a movable extension that extends north or south to whatever map object you want to measure degrees. That angle is the degrees of latitude. They are equal distant, regardless of where you are north or south of the equator, with the exception of a slight difference in the length of a degree of latitude as you approach the poles simply because of the curvature of Earth, but it's so minimal that we don't deal with it. This is the universal transverse Mercator grid, so it's another way of looking at coordinates and plotting them on the Earth. What it does though, because it is a rectangular grid, is it distorts the area of features like here's Greenland and it's just not that big. So it's stretching features. It runs all the way around the planet. There are 60 zones that are uh, six degrees of longitude in width. And those zones run from uh, north latitude about 80 to south latitude about 80. And they're numbered sequentially. So if we look at Alabama, I'm pointing to it right now, it's in UTM zone 16. How does this work? Well, um, we're not going to talk about this false easting. Um, it's a Cartesian coordinate system. So its measurement units are meters. So, and the point of measurement is the western edge of the zone. So if we could step, if, if our gate was a meter and we stepped 238,000 meters or steps east of the western edge, that's the UTM's easting. It's expressed as easting, 238,000 meters east. That's not of the central meridian, that's of the western edge of the zone. The zone starts at the western edge at zero. For northing, which is north-south plot, so we're talking about X and Ys, an easting of 298,000 meters, perhaps, starts at zero at the equator in the northern hemisphere. So if Alabama is 2,500,000 steps north of the equator and 298,000 east of the western edge of the time zone, the UTM will be 298,000 meters east and 2,500,000 meters north. That's how it's expressed. The zones are basically 674,000 meters wide at the equator. That equals six degrees of longitude. As they approach the poles, they converge, so they get narrower and narrower and um, take up a fewer or smaller amount of distance. So they're expressed as easting and northing. Easting increases as you move east from the western edge of a particular UTM zone. Northing increases as you move north from the equator, decreases from 10 million at the equator if you're moving south, and easting does the same thing. Here's the point about universal transverse Mercator. Universal transverse Mercator has a redundancy. So the same UTM coordinates could exist in all 60 zones. So when you're expressing a UTM coordinate, you must, absolutely must, state what zone you're talking about. So once again, Alabama's in 16. 
actually the central meridian runs through the middle of the state so it's a really nice projection for preserving the area of the state the shape of the state and keeping it kind of vertical in a map this movie i'm going to skip over but I will post it and you can have a look at it. It's all about navigation, latitude, and longitude. Uh, nowadays, we use global positioning systems technology to record latitude and longitude. Everybody has it on their cell phone. Uh, most be, a lot of people use it when they're driving. We don't really think about determining uh, latitude and longitude or the exact coordinates of any position on a map anymore when we go there. The satellites do it all for us. And I'm not going to go into the satellite technology now other than to say they triangulate and they're measuring the time it takes a signal to get to a particular point on the ground and return to that satellite so they can calculate that distance, do the geometry and come up with a uh, three to four other satellites for a fairly accurate plot of where that point entity is in latitude and longitude. This is a little exercise I went through uh, doing my dissertation. This is a 1924 Kilmartin map of the site of Chichen Itza in the Yucatan Peninsula, Mexico. Carnegie staff did a really good survey of that back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, produced good maps. I used it in my dissertation to uh, look at the spatial arrangement of architectural structures and also examine water resource usage. And uh, there's the old director, my hero, Savanus Morley, who um, managed the Carnegie expeditions. This is a Chichen Itza map. This one's 1935. And so what I did is I went out and I selected on the map points that I knew I could find with a GPS data collector on the ground at the site of Chichen Itza. So I went there and recorded those points. You can see them right here. There's one at the Castillo, one at the end of the ball court, one at the Temple of the Warriors. So they're all over. So I recorded those with a Trimble, Trimble GPS data collector. Um, that's not an easy thing to do, but uh, we'll go into that sometime later. Once I did that, I recorded those in a GIS, in the GIS as point features, and then took the old paper maps, scanned them, and then georeferenced them. Actually put the corresponding point that was plotted in the GIS which is a virtual representation of real world coordinates and was able to warp that map and put it right in a GIS, then digitize, draw those features, and then be able to really analyze uh, those kinds of relationships, geospatial relationships. Here's collecting GIS positions. This is a serpent head column base in a quarry. Small little data collector standing there uh, taking those positions. This is an older version of a GPS. We have much newer versions of those now that actually um, you can put maps as backgrounds in them. Those points when you collect them are put into a software called Pathfinder Office uh, 2.8. Now the version's about 5 and we do what's called differential corrections. These are all you see these things that look like windswept sands. They all represent one point. The software takes all of those readings and calculates the centroid of those points. And it also looks at atmospheric corrections um, that are based on taking uh, points in known base stations where we know the latitude, longitude, and then looking at the variation through. So that's the map of Chichen Itza now in a GIS. There are several of them plotted in position over top of a high resolution uh, panchromatic air photo image. So you can see the value of understanding coordinates and latitude and longitude in recovering historical data like all of these maps 
um, back when they had no opportunity to look at geospatial relationships like we do today. Once those maps were in place, all of the features were digitized, including the contours, and we created digital elevation models of that so we could actually look at the topography of the land. Okay, let's look at map functions, back at generic maps now. Maps function in several ways. They communicate information. They preserve information that could be changing, like coastlines. They record whatever you need to record about a particular location. They can be used to calculate distance based on their scale, direction, or azimuth. They can be used to calculate area. They record physical and cultural types of features and distributions. This is a 1561 to 1575 Italian map of Africa. Admittedly, the continent from space does not look like that. But this has rivers, it has cities, it has lakes, it has coastlines, islands, um, all of those things that maps can preserve. And thankfully, we have these historical maps because many of these features are gone. Let's talk for a minute about scale. There are three different kinds of scales that you'll run into in GIS or in cartography in general. Verbal scale. Verbal scale is just a stated scale. One inch represents 10 miles. What does that mean? Well, scale is the relationship between map units of any kind and their counterparts distance on the surface of the earth. So this basically says that if you measure two inches between two points on a map, that equals 20 miles of distance. Simple as that. Graphic scales you'll find on most maps. Um, this one here indicates that the distance between zero and one is one kilometer. Usually they're broken up into subunits. Zero, two, two kilometers, zero, three, three kilometers. Very easy to use. You just take a scale or a piece of paper and put some tick marks on it and measure distances. You're guessing in between if you don't have units. Representative fraction is the most versatile scale uh, it's used for the seven and a half minute USGS topographic map series. Um, representative fraction basically states that one unit of any form of measurement colon is equal to 50,000 of the same unit on the surface of the earth. Very versatile. So if you're somewhere and you don't have anything to measure but your thumbnail and you got five thumbnails between two points, it is equal to 250,000 thumbnail distances, okay? So you can go back into the office and measure your thumbnail. So it can be used if you're using inches or if you're into the metric system, which is much more versatile. So most versatile representative fraction, one unit surface of the, on the measurement on the map is equal to 50,000 of the same units. Okay, small versus large scale. They're just basically levels of generalization. A large scale reveals more detail on a map. So a one to 2,000 map, one unit of what area you're measuring um, is equal to 2,000 of it on the surface of the earth is one divided by 2000 equals 0 0.0005. That's called a large scale map. Shows a lot of detail. Small scale equals less detail. We're, think about coastlines, if you will. One to 500,000 is one divided by 500,000 equals 0 0.000002. That's a small scale map. So think about it this way. Can't reveal all the details. So as we get to world maps, you're looking at one to two million kinds of representative fractions or one to 1.8 million representative fractions. In that, that scale, the coast, east coastline of Florida looks like a straight line. But at one to 2,000, it's all jagged. You see all of the ins and outs, the coves, the bays, the islands, everything that's associated um, to that. What's the largest scale you can get to? One to one. Why would you want to do that? That's 
way too large. So keep in mind after you understand all of this that a GIS has a moving scale. If you zoom in in a GIS, the scale becomes larger. As you zoom out on the screen in a GIS, the scale becomes smaller. So becomes specific, zoomed in, to generalized, zoomed out. And you can manipulate that. So GIS has taken us a little ways beyond having to deal with drawing and setting up scales on paper maps. Okay, what are maps? The geographic definition of a map is a graphic representation of physical features, natural, artificial, or both, of a part of a part or the whole of the Earth's surface by means of signs and symbols or photographic imagery at an established scale on a specified projection and with the means of orientation, orientation indicated. So we have to have signs or symbols. We have to have a scale. We have to have a projection and we have to have a means of orientation, north, south. What's the projection do? Tell you what's preserved in the map. If it, if it is a uh, azimuthal, it's telling you that what's basically best preserved in that map is direction um, between two points or azimuth as you will. So this is an old map of Florida. Um, I believe this particular map is not really a map in the truest definition. I don't see a north arrow on there. Okay, there are different kinds of maps. There are real maps. They're tangible, permanent form, printed, sketch, photographic, relief models. You can actually put your hands on them, okay? Real maps. There are some real map types. They're planimetric, topographic, thematic, cartograms, and remotely sensed. We'll go through all of them. This is a planimetric map. It just is also commonly known as a base or outline map or CAD maps, computer-aided drawing and design maps. There are cadastral maps and line maps, but they're base or outline maps. They're two-dimensional. They show no topography, no representation of the surface, the smoothness or roughness of the surface of the planet, generally just outline, outline maps. Here's a base or outline map of the United States. You can see that you can see where the lakes are. You can probably see where rivers are with lines, and you can see the boundaries of the states. That's it. You can't do anything else with that map. You could see a north-south, an east-west, or whatever, but that's basically it with an outline map. This is the first step in representing a portion of the surface, the surface of the Earth. This is a CAD map. This is actually a site core at Chichen Itza. I designed this map. It's done in a software called uh, MicroStation. And you can see you can get real detailed. Actually, these are contour lines, but they have no values. So this is, once again, a planimetric kind of map with no representation of height. This is a cadastral map. Cadastral maps are boundary maps. Surveyors use them. They show lot locations. Lot locations. Actually, this looks like a cemetery, but I'm not sure it is. But lot locations, they show street center lines, street boundaries, right-of-ways, those kind of things. So once again, no indication of the surface of the planet. Is it rough? Are there hills in here? Are there dips in here? Whatever. Planimetric. And once again, a line map. This is an engineering map that shows um, the street. And uh, I believe this is... Uh, water lines probably through there. No representation, once again, of the surface of the planet or what we call topography, which is different from topology in GIS. Topographic maps, on the other hand, represent the surface of the planet. There are a bunch of these out there for your use. USGS seven and a half minute quad sheets. They're all at one to 24,000 scale, contour CADs, so CAD maps that have contours, 3D surface maps. 
Uh, we'll see those. Bathymetric maps, nautical charts, aeronautical charts, engineering maps, flood control maps, and landscapes. So let's take a look at those. This is actually a topographic sheet right here. Okay, this is USGS 7.5 minute quadrangle map. If you took 3940, you probably use these a lot. <clears throat> um, I can't tell where this is because of the size of it. I believe it's Pennsylvania and I believe it's Harrisburg. They have contour lines on there. If you look at the contour lines, the closer the contour lines are to each other because they are printed at a contour interval <clears throat> that represent changes in elevation and they're equal changes in elevation. So if they're close together, steep slope, far apart, more level ground. So here you can see we're tracing along very steep slopes and here we have uh, the northern side of those blue mountains is uh, a less more shallow degree of slope than the southern side of it. That's topographic representation. That's a mountain range. Um, here's one of Daytona Beach. I used to teach at Emory Riddle Aeronautical University. What a great job. Uh, drove to Daytona Beach every day and taught. Well, isn't that a wonderful profession? Hated to leave that. This is a contour CAD. Um, this is a map of a site called Sea Ho. Um, I got from the surveyor's structures in here. And you can see all these lines represent uh, contour lines of equal elevation change. So you can see now what's represented is height of buildings and depressions. Topographic. 3D surface. You may not have seen these. You may have. Um, they're printed in plastic, a lot of them, just a plastic sheet. And the contours are raised. So the surface of this is rough, representing the surface of the planet. Here's a depression. Um, one thing that you need to keep in mind is these are vertically exaggerated. So we have this scale, this horizontal scale, which represents the two-dimensional distance between objects. How, how big is the map and what's the relationship between the map and real distance in the real world, in the surface of the Earth? Well, uh, as I said earlier in this lecture, if we had the same scale vertically as we did horizontally on a globe that represents the whole Earth, it would be as smooth as a bowling ball. So how do we deal with that? We exaggerate the vertical scale. So in this particular map, the horizontal scale, east, west, north, south, might be 1 to 500,000. The vertical scale might be 1 to 5,000, so that these bumps are high, and you can envision that there's elevation there, there's elevated terrain there. Here's my point. It's exaggerated. It's not a true representation of reality. It's only there because uh, we want to see those bumps represented. Not accurate at all, but it's there. This is a bathymetric map. This is San Diego. You'll notice that they are contours. These are depths of the ocean. So once again, we have the uh, topographic uh, image, if you will, of the bay shore, the bottom of the bay. These are nautical charts. They're used by people who float boats around and drive boats around. Once again, they indicate, if you will, uh, depth of the bay areas. That's what they're concerned about. And also sandbars, things like that are illustrated, dumping grounds right here. And those depths tell them that topographic relationship of the bottom of the Bay Area so they don't run aground. Aeronautical charts, this is a shaded relief one, but it has elevation on it and the shading is as if the sun was coming from the southwest into this map and you can see the shading of the mountains. Other thing that aeronautical charts represent is if you look, they're broken up by quads and they have these large numbers that say 2.8. 
Bet you can't guess what that means unless you're a pilot. Well, what it means is that if you're flying anywhere in this quad below 3,200 feet, 3,200 feet, you might just fly into something because that's the highest feature. What could it be? It could be a radio antenna, it could be a mountaintop, it could be anything. But they give you this guidance for flying through the area. So if you're coming down here, you should stay above 3,200 feet. Here you could go down to maybe 3,200. And by the time you get down here, you could go down to 2,800 feet. Um, I fly small airplanes, so I'm really pleased that aeronautical charts help us with this. This is an engineering map. This is a um, strip mine. So um, it has elevations. You can see we're getting deeper and deeper down in the strip mine. And it also represents roadways in here. So once again, shows topography. And this is flood control maps. They're generally uh, developed from quad sheets or some other surveyed kind of map that has topography. I'm an archaeologist, so I survey topography with laser total stations and GPS data collectors. And what we can do in the GIS is literally flood these areas that are the lowest areas and see what would be inundated. So flood control topographic. I did that for um, the campus, flooded the campus based on certain rainfall. And finally, landscape maps, where um, landscape engineers and designers have to take into consideration a slope and angle. And you can see these lines, they represent slope down. Now, in a GIS, we do deal with thematic maps. So we make thematic maps. There are several kinds. There are true thematics, coral pleth, dot distribution, isoline flow maps, and cartograms. So let's look at the difference between them. A true thematic map permits whatever the variable is you're trying to represent to follow its natural distribution. So it doesn't generalize it by any political boundary. This is world topography. So you can see the hilly plains level terrain area it runs through several political entities, never stops at a boundary. It's following its natural distribution. We could do this with surface temperature. We could do this with sea level. We could do this with topography, rainfall, all sorts of things. But for true thematic, you don't constrain it or generalize it by any other cultural boundary, any cultural boundary. You don't generalize it. You'll see the difference. That's true thematic. This is a choropleth. Think of a coloring chart. <clears throat> what it does is it looks at the distribution of whatever you're measuring and then generalizes about it based on where it exists. So this is Asian and Pacific Islander persons, percent of total population, and it's ranked by color. 50 or more is dark purple, and you can see those. It's for every county in the United States. So if we imagine Asian and Pacific Islander person's population, they wouldn't stop at these boundaries. It wouldn't stop. It would follow a general pattern. But because we're constraining it to a political boundary, it stops right there. In reality, it doesn't. So this would flow a lot differently. That's a choropleth map. Most of the thematics you do will do statistics and create choropleth maps, coloring maps, color in the blanks. Dot distribution. Dot distribution is probably the best representation of the geospatial distribution of anything you want to measure. Why is that? Well, what we're doing here is we're saying each dot represents 50 people and this is Twin Cities metropolitan area. So we're looking at dots that represent 50 people. And when there's a lot of 50 peoples in a small area, those dots are really close together. So the center of this map is highly populated and you can tell it as you move out 
in any direction from the center of that Twin Cities area, you'll notice that the dots start spacing out. So you can really, really get a good visual of where the dense populations are in this area. If this was a choropleth map um, and this was two different counties, this county might be one color and the county to the east or north, wherever the counties were, might be another color or be the same color. You couldn't tell anything about where these people live. Now, dot distributions do make generalizations, so they generalize where the dense area is, but not necessarily street by street. If you want to do that, you'll have to get census data. This is isoline. <clears throat> isoline is like topographic maps. It's based on interpolation of frequencies or temperature ranges uh, based on given points. So in this particular map, we might have 25 stations that are taking uh, departures from uh, normal temperature, okay? So they're taking the temperatures. And then what we do is grid this off and draw lines between areas of equal value. So that area right there is an equal temperature departure. And as we move to here, that line defines an area. All interpolation, generalization. USGS, seven and a half minute quad sheets are to an extent done this way for the topography. <clears throat> this is a really general illustration. It's called a flow map. These are cores of some of the major religious traditions in the world. Uh, from their core, you can take arrows based on whatever data you collect and show where or how that particular religious belief system uh, dispersed um, across the planet into other areas. These are cartograms. Cartograms are fun because what they do is they make a true representation of the value of whatever you're measuring and distort the physical feature that you're measuring. So this one is U.S. congressional districts based upon population density throughout the years. And you can see uh, where the population's growing and where it's declining. So they distort that. If imagine, if you would, a cartogram that shows the distribution of the consumption of goods and services um, throughout the world, the United States would be much larger, much larger than its physical boundaries. That's a cartogram. <clears throat> now we have some remotely sensed uh, maps. Landsat thematic mapper, a Searcy radar I've worked with in air photos. This is Landsat Thematic Mapper. It represents um, reflected solar energy. We call it a passive sensor. So the green area is reflected solar energy and is generally green um, chlorophyll producing plants. Uh, red areas might be uh, areas where there's high amount of growth. That represents an infrared band. And then the blue is water. This is northern Yucatan Peninsula. Very good representations of, of the real world based on Landsat thematic mapper. This is a remotely sensed Circe radar. <clears throat> radar is what we call an active sensor. It emits electromagnetic wave, goes out, interacts with the surface of the earth, and reflects back based on its backscatter or reflectance. Uh, we're able to determine surface roughness, characteristics of the surface. Every, it reflects back off everything except water. When it hits water, it reflects at a angle equal to the incident angle, how it came in, out away from the target. So it's really good for looking at land water interface. I was using this to study in the Yucatan Peninsula, actually studying the versatility of it, uh, if it to show uh, Salinas or areas where the ancient Maya were producing salt. Here you can see a bridge that goes across the bay, but very, very good for land water interface because once it hits the water, it's gone. Get a black return. 
These are air photos. We get high resolution air photos. They're at a variety of scales. If you read along the bottom margin, it'll tell you the scale. This one's one to 6,000. What does that mean? That means that one of any unit of measurement on this air photo is equal to 6,000 of that corresponding unit on the surface of the earth. This one's Ushmal, uh, which is an archeological site. Um, this next one to the right is one to 15,000. So the plane was flying at a higher altitude. And this is a street grid. They're usually very accurate and you can um, take into consideration parallax and all those distortions and orthorectify these so that whatever point you are anywhere on this air photo represents its true uh, north, south, east, west position in the real world. We use these kinds of uh, maps air photos, satellite imagery, those kind of things um, in remote sensing to digitize uh, features in the real world. This is a virtual map. Everybody operates on a virtual map. You have a virt virtual map in your head, recorded in your brain, of how you get to AUM in the morning. You don't think about it. Um, you don't read street signs. You don't look at markers. You just drive here. You know how to get here. You can close your eyes and imagine driving here. That's a virtual map. So they're mental images, if you will, or in some sense, computer images of a aspect of the real world. Interestingly, infants start forming mental images of their world very early. By the time of the age four, um, if you ask any child uh, to map or draw a map, they're generally going to put their house right in the center of the map. And then out from their house, they might put the church, if they're believers. Uh, they might put the grocery store. They might put the school. They might put their friend's house. But they already have this orthographic looking down on bird's eye view of their world. Those are mental images. You can convert virtual maps to real maps. So this is um, uh, geographic information systems and how it uses images to um, look at real world relationships. And I think that for this particular lecture. I'm just going to stop here. And if you want to take a look at the rest of this slideshow, you're welcome to. But um, this is really what you need to know about maps. So with that, I'm going to sign off.